So good morning. Um, not a large audience, but uh, special people. Thank you for uh, being early in the morning of Saturday here. Um, the first, the second uh, session uh, of the seminar, uh, the first for today, is uh, the Belt and Road Initiative: A Global and Regional Perspective. And uh, chair is uh, Professor Konstantinos Arvanitopoulos former Minister of Education, um, and uh, I pass the floor to him. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all from me as well, and uh, let me uh, start by thanking the uh, organizers for putting together such an important conference on uh, such a timely geopolitical issue. And let me take the time also to commend the uh, Lascaridis Foundation, Mr. Lascaridis and uh, the General Director, Mr. Mazarakis, for setting up a program at the prestigious Tsinghua University. I think this has been uh, very important because it's, the program has been instrumental in enhancing the understanding be between our two countries, between our two people, between our two cultures. And, um, and I do think that um, uh, over the last year, uh, a lot of our colleagues have visited China, um, uh, and so they have been able to appreciate uh, the Chinese culture, the um, Chinese political system, the um, uh, development and modernization that has occurred in China over the last decades. And I do believe that this is uh, very important in, uh, in many respects. Uh, today we have a great panel for us, uh, with us today. And uh, uh, let me also welcome our Chinese colleagues. We were in China um, a few months ago, and uh, uh, let me thank them for their hospitality there. We were together with uh, my colleague Thanasis Platyas uh, at Tsinghua University, and uh, we had a great time, and I want to thank them once again for their hospitality and, uh, and their kindness, and uh, welcome them to Athens and to this conference. Um, as Mr. Mazaraki said, our, our session today is about the Belt and Road Initiative, and um, we have uh, with us Zhao Keizin, a professor and vice dean of the School of Social Sciences at Tsinghua University. Also Dr. Yunnan, postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Institute of International Relations, again at Tsinghua University. And of course my colleague Thanasi Patias from the uh, um, Department of International European Studies at Piraeus University. Uh, with no further ado, let me, uh, let me give the floor to uh, Professor Keizin. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm humbled to be to be on here. This is my first trip to to Greece, but uh, I'm very familiar with the great ancient Greece culture. So, as a student of uh, of China, we all know the great name in ancient Greece, such like Plato and Aristotle. So their contribution to uh, civilization, not only uh, of West, but of the rest of the world, uh, lead us to a civilized stage. And uh, we learn a lot from Greece. So I see so, uh, so, uh, just to come here to uh, have a new dialogue with the Greece culture and uh, uh, my friends here. Uh, and today, uh, uh, Professor Zhang Lihua asked, us, asked me to uh, talk about my views towards uh, Belt and Road Initiative and its implications to uh, China-Greece relationship. So uh, maybe for uh, most of international uh, friends, uh, they uh, have some you know, uh, confused views uh, about Belt and Road. What is the Belt and Road? What is the One Belt and One Road? And some mo lots of ideas came in mind, and uh, there are many wars and diversified wars in China, not only in uh, spokesmen of uh, Chinese government, but also the 
the even you know the the professors, the scholars of China universities. So uh, we should know why China uh, allocate uh, a Belt and Road, and what is the definition of Belt and Road, and uh, what's the implications to the whole world. So first, I want to uh, begin the the questions. So uh, for Belt and Road Initiative is the uh, initiative uh, proposed by President Xi himself. So from the beginning, I uh, took take a part uh, take part in the discussions, and the most of my colleagues uh, so take a very uh, negative views about that, because you know we know there are lots of troubles in uh, inner land of China. So. There are mountains to block the communications and transportations between China and uh, Central Asia and the Middle East. So that can block the terrorism and some security uh, uh, challenges. So if these uh, these uh, uh, difficulties have been uh, have been overcome, so they may be uh, more convenient for the terrorist and some. Uh, other security challenges we all, you know, uh, trouble China. So that's why most of scholars and professors uh, take a not positive view, view toward that. So, but according to President Xi, he mentioned a lot about the three deficit of the of our world, the deficit of uh, of peace. So you can look this picture. So there are uh, lots of. Uh, these trouble areas with uh, you know uh, uh, turbulence and uh, and conflicts. So just uh, uh, North America and Europe and you know other uh, islands you know have a very peaceful uh, situation. But uh, in the land of of the Europe, uh, Europe Asia continent and uh, Africa, so there are lots of troubles and uh, uh, conflicts every year. So which trouble the cities of there? So as a uh, uh, as global citizen of us, we st still, you know, felt some uh, feel some uh, uh, challenges, and even tragedy we used, you know, to to challenge the security of of Greece and even the whole Europe. So that is the security gap. We should you know, narrow down the gap, make to do something to make contribution to the peace building and the peace making. And uh, for the developed uh, for the developed uh, deficit. So you can, you know, for Africa, Middle East, and uh, Central Asia, South Southeast Asia, so the, there's a low development areas, which also the, you know, the reason why our world is uh, not stable. So we should do something to, you know, narrow down the the uh, development deficit. And for government de deficit, for Donald Trump, you know, there, so he, you know, kick off the WTO and other international organizations. And uh, just uh, you know, take uh, U.S. outside of the whole world. So, and uh, thus far, the dominant international government system has had had been formulated uh, by the you know the Western power. So, as a member of a uh, global uh, uh, member of a world uh, uh, international community, China and other you know developing countries did not make some contribution to the you know to formulating of the. The the the, the uh, world order since uh, second world war uh, the second world war, so that's why President Xi Jinping called the 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 Belt Road Initiative and trying to you know promote the common community of uh, shared future. So Belt and Road to connect the East East Asia uh, economic uh, circles to 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 West Europe, you know to. Uh, Build up some uh, 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 roads and bridges to connect these two uh, blocks, and to make the world to be a stable one. To work together, you know, to make contribution to the whole world peace and uh, prosperous, and uh, even to promote the global governance system. That's all the reason why behind of the uh, President Xi's uh, initiative. And uh, second, so how to define the Belt and Road Initiative? According to my studies, I find that fundamentally, you know, BRN is a China plan of a new globalization. So we uh, we all know what the definition of globalization, but thus far, the definition of a globalization 
uh, is more dominated by the Western uh, views, the, you know, the European and the United States. So what's the views of the developing countries? What's the views of China? So now President Xi tell us China should have a clear definition of globalization. We you know, embraced globalization and with uh, our own understanding. So Belt and Road Initiative is the China's solution to new globalization. So what's the difference between the old globalization and the new globalization? So, to my views, you know, the old globalization is a globalization and integration to, you know, to identify the, you know, necessary change of the uh, political system. But for China's Belt and Road Initiative, there is uh, no intention to challenge or, you know, to transform others' political system. We just highlight the interconnections, intercollaborations, and inter interactions. So to government to government, business to business, and the people to people, just to connect us, you know, as a, as a network, rather than to just uh, throw your domestic political system away. So that's China's wisdom. We can work together <coughs> without changing your own, own ways of, you know, uh, political uh, uh, operation. So, what the new global, globalization is, according to President Xi, the new globalization is a globalization with a shared community, you know, to, to joint discussions, joint constructions, and shared benefits. So win-win cooperation. We can benefit, but we can we would not challenge others' benefits. We can just follow the consensus consensus-driven model, you know, to realized our uh, dream. So that's the China's wisdom based on the, the ancient traditional uh, uh, ideas such as Taoism and Confucianism and even you know, some Buddhism from, uh, from India. So this is the, the similar understanding like ancient Greece to Plato and Aristotle. They all highlight more the, the mixed constitutions. You know, for Plato, he, uh, he emphasized the, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the republic, you know, for the, you know, uh, uh, oligarchy, monarchy, and uh, democracy, to bring them together, you know, to make adoption from each, you know, each form of the arrangement. So, and in China, we all, you know, to make a fusion of the, the civilization, uh, domestic and international, to, you know, to, to have a new one. So that we, we form a similar uh, approach. So that's, that's the China wisdom, and uh, uh, for uh, just a brief, uh, brief picture of the Belt and Road Initiative for one vision of uh, the, the shared community and uh, two level operation, national and uh, local level. National level also for China issued a world map, a world map and a vision and, uh, and action of the, uh, uh, the, the document issued by the state council. And for local level, you can easily identifying some cities and the local governments and in you know in, in, in Belt Road. What about the multi multilateral and uh, you know international level? So that's an open question for us. So in the in the uh, Belt and second uh, session of Belt and Road Forum, some scholars and professors suggest that we should promote the multilateral framework for Belt and Road. But for the top leader, they take a cautious attitude. They want to, you know, to get the positive response from the international community rather than just, you know, to push the China unilateral framework of multilateral. This is a Chinese wisdom. And for three, you know, three uh, players, you know, business community, government agencies, and the global civil society consists of NGOs, think tanks, universities, and other social players. So for four pillars of the infrastructure, industrial parks, investor flow, and inter interconnections. So according to China's government, we have uh, five coordinations from policy to P2P. This is a one, two, four, five of uh, Belt and Road Initiative. It's a very brief picture for, for this initiative. And uh, China, you know, make uh, lots of contribution to this, uh, to this initiative for, you know, for four, 40 billion US dollars for, you know, uh, Secret Road Fund and 50 billion US dollars to AIB and other initiatives and uh, uh, grants to support Belt and Road. It, 
In sum, we can, you know, know the logic behind the Belt and Road Initiative. It's not a politics among nations. It's a politics among networks. I clarify this this idea as on my class many many times. Maybe Vasilis has has had already attended my class. And the 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 basic form of the of this politics is a network of a shared community. And this community is. Uh, promoted by not only uh, not from multilateral coordination, but also the, the polylateral, you know, to invite social players and uh, uh, TNCs to join the uh, uh, operation. That's the, the 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 logic behind the Belt and Road. The second, what are the new uh, uh, the new uh, development of the second BRF? So the the, the key words of the second BRF is the High quality of global development. So, according to President Xi Jinping, we has already finished the you know the great work of Belt and Road Initiative. But we should focus on specific issues and try to find some solutions to enhance the the cooperation and to you know win the support from the international community. So, according to China's uh, views and the discussions uh, on the forum. So uh, there are three points that we should uh, 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 emphasize. Number one is China want to promote the Belt and Road with high quality development is uh, uh, not uh, to not to find a better government. We want to find a better governance. So from Plato and Aristotle, all the established scholars highlight the importance of the you know the good government the government. But now China moved the focus from good government to good governance. So the established approach, like a Marshall Plan and the Europe EU's, uh, European Union's uh, uh, integration, all highlights the importance that you know to change the institution. So, for example, for Greece, if you join the EU, you should uh, you narrow down your your domestic governing body, and to follow the you know the the the, the joint uh, arrangement by the EU, the by Brussels rather than Athens. Okay. So, but for China, we should uh, we should not challenge the you know the sovereignty of the membership. We should uh, you know to. Uh, to take a, a route of globalization without institutional uh, reform, to give a more open to middle and small power, to respect the requirements and their response and the feelings of the Belt and Road, and take a cautious attitude towards the Belt and Road, and to take a, a more inclusive to other stakeholders like companies uh, and, uh, and NGOs. That is a more fairness to the all social players. We should, uh, you know, uh, Take uh, outreach views towards the Belt and Road, rather than just take hands of the government officials and the leaders of the uh, participants. And the second point is these are uh, academic studies. Uh, so, in my views, thus far, most of the scholars in Belt and Road studies doesn't do not uh, do not identify that there is a clear academic approach. Thus far, you know, from the dominant views of uh, 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 international development studies, uh, from UK to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to United States. So Marshall Plan and other foreign is all, you know, highlights important in international development studies. But now China, you know, uh, highlights the importance of global development studies, GDS. You know, to such a, this is the approach like SDG Sustainable uh, Development Goals by UN and the third party cooperation model. So Ch China has already worked together with Greece to promote the third party cooperation programs. And uh, SPV, SPV is a financial model, special purpose vehicle. You know, to China can make contribution to the to a fund and to uh, follow the established rules and to, to attract more capital to join, and you know to focus on specific issues, such as the, uh, the the harbors and the environment protections. So this SPV can you know follow the you know dominant view, dominant arrangement of the international community and the cool harbors. This is very important the new development in Belt and Road. China and Japan now work together, you know. 
toward to uh, set up the cool harbor system. For example, the harbor of Ningbo in China and the harbor of Kobe in Japan can, you know, can each side can uh, 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 make contribution to a cool harbor, you know, to based on the citizen harbors in the past 30 years and to uh, set out a, a specific area to this, this area is not only affiliated with China, but also affiliated with Japan to follow the, 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 the most uh, liberal arrangement of the, of the, how to say, liberal, arbor, uh, liberal harbors. Now, this is a, a new uh, institutional arrangement. And the third is, uh, so Belt and Road tried to provide a global public goods rather than a global private goods. So, Previously, UN and the, and the MF, World Bank, all these international arrangements has been dominated by the established great powers. So the middle and small powers cannot, you know, uh, get a, a legal side, a legal mate position uh, in the decision making process. So and China want to, you know, pretty deliver the real global, uh, globalized public goods, you know, to. Uh, provide a governance by shared network, consists of globalized states, globalized business, and global civil, civil societies. So this new arrangement is off the network, by the network, and for the network. Okay, this is very clear. Uh, and so that's China's arrangement, you know, to, uh, to connect Europe, Africa, and, and Asia to, through the belt and the road, you know, to, uh, deliver a real global public goods. Everybody, not only you are a government official, but also so you are a, 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 a owner of people, you can, you know, go into this, uh, 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 join these uh, 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 games and uh, to find your own cake. You know, this is the, 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 the theoretical logic of the Belt Road. And some implications to Greece and, and, and China. So number one, I think that China and, and, and Greece should work together to share the resources and cap, uh, uh, capability, uh, capacities. You know, for, for Greece, Greece is a very, very uh, great civilization with a lot of wisdom. We can learn a lot. We can open a new uh, renaissance you know, to, you know, to uh, uh, help build the road. So that's the... The, the, the advantages of Greece and to uh, make a full use of the high quality of civilization resources on the one side and China to share the huge, the huge capacity of manufacturers. So that's to bring the civilization of Greece and capacity uh, of China to you know, combine them together. That will create an accepted uh, uh, easy, uh, 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 results. And second, to lead a global dialogue in civilizations. This is a very good advantage for us. So Greece represents the start point of Western civilization, and China is the East, you know, to hand in hand, and we will make more contribution to the human being uh, in, uh, with the globalized views. And to create uh, global partners for the fourth interrelation of uh, 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 revolution. So that is uh, the share. A second and third party cooperation. So through the, you know, China and uh, Greece work together to focus on third parties, you know, to, to from, the, from the Greece, the Greece can take a monitor, you know, to oversee the operation. So if the Western, uh, Western powers have some, you know, Worry about the possible negative arrangement from China. You can, you know, oversee and can uh, issue some uh, some report to clarify some suspicions from the established powers. And China can do more, you know, to uh, for the specific uh, 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 program. And the third, stakeholders in global governance for UN, for WTO and for other international arrangement. We can work together, and I, I do believe Greece has a lot of resources and the lessons to help China to be more fairness and transparent, high transparency, and to be 
uh, easy to accept it by the members of the international community. Last but not least, United States. We should not, you know, escape the uh, the rule of the United States. Now, a uh, bad news is the Vice Premier Liu He does not, you know, uh, win the support from the U.S. But we can work 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 hard. We can continue the discussion to persuade the U.S. to join the the operation. But Greece can help us. You know, we can work together to lobby the United States. Rather than just you know through United States, that's a totally bad idea for that. We should work together, hand by hand, with all the participants, the nation states and the social players. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kazin, for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I think three important takeaways from his lecture. Number one, that. Um, uh, for China, BRI is not um, an antagonistic project. I think it's a cooperative scheme. China sees BRI as a cooperative scheme, a non-zero-sum game uh, with shared benefits. Uh, this is an important one. The second was the last point that uh, Professor Kezin made, that um, China does not pose as a spoiler of uh, the international world order, but as a reformer of this order. And the third, as far as um, relations with Greece are concerned, uh, um, the, uh, there is an appreciation uh, between the two great civilizations. And for China, Greece might be a good partner, good partner to uh, engage in a, in, 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 a, uh, in a discussion, in a dialogue, in a global dialogue uh, about civilizations. Now, Professor Platias has the floor. Kalimera, good morning. I would like, first of all, to thank the Chinese delegation for being here in the conference and for the hospitality that they extended to us in our two-week visiting uh, in uh, February and March in China. Uh, we really learn a lot, and we also thank the Lascaridis Foundation. Perfect. Uh, and we also thank the Lascaridis Foundation for creating this program that enabled our visit. And uh, Vasilis and Mr. Gikas were instrumental on making our Chinese experience really fruitful and really huge learning experience. Now, what I will try to do today is to add a layer of what the previous speaker has said. I think the previous speaker has laid down the logic of the Belt and Road Initiative. I would like to add some geopolitical and geoeconomic considerations on top of what he says in order to, to make the picture a little more complete. Okay, the Belt and Road Initiative is basically a huge infrastructural project. So here we get an interesting idea that infrastructure can be a part of grand strategy. And it's part of the Chinese grand strategy, huge infrastructural projects. Now, infrastructure is not just something neutral. It can have huge strategic implications. And let me give you an example from the Greek history. Let's start from this place, from Piraeus. The port of Piraeus, before the Persian invasion, used to be at Phaliron. But Phaliron was an open port, and it was very easy to access by the sea. So a clever Greek statesman, Themistocles, moved the port a little to the west and make this port here, outside, there, the center of the port and included two more ports, the main port that now Costco is and another little port, Microlimano, on the other side. So these three ports became the port of Athens. And then he did an interesting thing after he moved the port. 
He fortified it. The fortification was the public works. So he did the public work, moved the port, and then fortified it. And suddenly, boom, this completely changed the balance of power and the picture. Athens, a little stupid village in Attica, was suddenly transformed into a naval superpower just by two things, by moving the port and fortifying it and making Athens an island. An island not to be invaded by Sparta because of the, poor, or of the fortification. So an island that could dominate the sea and create wealth, power, and an empire. So public works is not as neutral as you are trying to suggest. Public work can have a lot of important economic and strategic implication. And my task today is to highlight some of the you highlighted the logic of China. I would like to highlight some of the strategic and economic implications of that logic. First of all, I'm fascinated that China has such a global vision that involves the whole planet and many decades. Uh, usually the West approaches international politics incrementally from one government to the other, from one administration to the other. So to have such a huge project that spans over 30 years and covers the globe is huge and unique, and I think China has to be commended for having such a global vision. That's very unique, and that's very important. Now, yesterday we hear a fascinating talk by Professor Lihua that emphasized harmony as the driving force of Chinese foreign policy. And today we hear the win-win cooperative approach. That's definitely one case. It stems from Chinese tradition, history, and culture. But I would like to say that this is also part of Chinese history. Uh, I think Chinese history also includes Marx that sees the world a little more conflictual terms. After all, it's the battle of classes. So harmony is not a necessary condition. It can be also a conflict. And today was fascinating to see how Plato and Aristotle fit on the Belt and Road Initiative, but I would like to bring another t uh, thinker, Thucydides, that sees the world a little more conflictual. And uh, before I get to Thucydides, let me comment on harmony and win-win. Uh, when I read Sun Tzu's Art of War, I was fascinated by the first paragraph. The first paragraph said that war is very important for the state, and the state has to prepare for war. Second paragraph said, in order to win the war, you need a good army, a good leader, and a good general. And third paragraph, harmony. So Confucian logic is important, but uh, Sun Tzu's art of war added a layer to the Confusions. Harmony is there, but also there is a possibility uh, of conflict. And in the international system, and the conflict and conflict of interest, it's an important consideration. And I will try to bring now the different perspectives from China, America, Europe, and Greece on the Belt and Road Initiative to highlight this kind of uh, different perspective. Okay, let's start with the international system. The international system after the collapse of the Soviet Union became unipolar. There is one country that emerged as dominant. The United States controlling something like 25% of the world GDP, controlling more than 50% 
of the world military expenditures and being the number one in the international system, and everybody was really apart. That's 91. And it's natural when a country has the monopoly to try to preserve it. So if you read the American doctrine, 91 is the number one objective of the United States. It's to maintain its position in the world, the primacy, and use this primacy to shape the events. That was official US strategy, to maintain the monopoly, to maintain unipolarity. Then China started growing really fast and approaching. 40 years ago, China was only 7% of the American GDP. Now it's 63%. And if you use other ratios like pursuing power, it has already overcome the, the, the United States. So it's natural that the United States to feel very defensive. There is a rising power approaching to the United States, and the United States is in relative decline. You, uh, let me clarify this. The United States, every year, it increases its power because it doesn't have negative growth. It adds power to itself. But in relative terms, its power is declining because China is rising faster. And according to some projections, in 10, 15 years, China will overcome the United States economically, and if it overcomes economically, if it translates its economic power to diplomatic and military, suddenly the unipolar system will become bipolar. And the Chinese actually said that in 30 years, when China will celebrate its 100th uh, year from the uh, Communist Party, will become global actor. A global actor, I interpret it to mean a bipolar system similar to the United States. So somehow in 30 years, the two countries will be at the, at the same level. Now, you have to understand from the United States, a rising power trying to, to reach the same level or overcome it, it's a threat. Or at least that's how they, they approach it. And history here and comes the Thucydides trap is that when the rising power try to claim its role in the world, usually the dominant power is feeling defensive, this creates fear to the dominant power. So the combination of power and fear creates apprehensions. And uh, as Thucydides said, one of the driving forces in uh, uh, international relation is fear. The second driving force is interest, and the third is reputation. So fear, it's very important. And this kind of global project, it naturally creates fears to the United States that it's not a neutral project, that the Chinese are projecting their economic power. So that's the view of the United States and this project that uh, spans all over Eurasia and up to, uh, to Europe, according to the United States logic, you get the infrastructure, but then you have to, protect, to protect the infrastructure. And the second movement will be after the economic, it's going to be the military. And this means that China will project its power. That's how the United States see the project. Now, let me add a layer to what you said on my uh, interpretation of what China is doing. I think that China is vulnerable because the United States control the sea. Uh, the United States has some geographical advantages. It's a country that has no threat from north and south, and it's protected by the two big oceans. <coughs> so the United States wants to control the oceans for its security. And following 
the, what the ancient Greeks said, that if you control the sea, you control the work, the world, because you control commerce, uh, they built their world dominance on the control of the sea. Navy has been the primary pillar of their superiority. Now, if you are Chinese and you have the Americans controlling the world and you are a trading power like China, uh, you feel very vulnerable. And how the United States control the sea? Mostly by controlling the choke points, the seven, eight important choke points of the world, like Suez, like Hormuz, like Gibraltar, like the Straits of Malacca. And look here, the Straits of Malacca. 80% of the Chinese oil import passes through one choke point. And about 25% of its uh, gas. And all the trade to the West, which means that just closing one choke point, which is very easy, especially if you control the sea. Essentially, you neutralize China from the world trade and make China vulnerable. So, on what you said, I also think that China, with the Belt and Road Initiative, tries to deal with this vulnerability by creating an alternative route. And this vulnerability actually is not only on the Strait of Malacca. Look at China. China is blocked by many choke points. It's not only the Strait of Malacca here, but you see, everywhere to get access even to the Pacific, it passes through choke points between Indonesia and Philippines, between Philippines uh, and Taiwan, and Taiwan and Japan. So you could you could completely take off China of the world trade, not only through the state of Malacca, which is west, but also east. So if I was Chinese and I could see this vulnerability at sea, naturally I would want to have an alternative route. And the alternative... Taiwan, China. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, if you look at this map, which is the same map that you uh, presented it, but it's China, but you don't control it, and the Americans are there, and they can block you. Uh, and I think, uh, I, and by the way, that's an interesting point, because if you could have control on Taiwan, a lot of your pressures, geopolitical uh, pressures on the, on the way uh, in your access to the sea would have been easier. With Taiwan under American influence, it's very easy to block China. So what you already suggested, it explains why China plays so much emphasis uh, on Taiwan, not only for historical political reasons, but also because of this map, for geopolitical reasons. Now, let's so that's the maritime belt road, or uh, Silk Road. If you look at the other one, it's clearly, you can see two things. First, it creates alternative to the maritime road that the Americans have complete control. And then, look, this Pakistan-China thing. It's another way to overcome the Strait of Malacca. So, the way because from the Indian Ocean you can transform goods and energy directly to China. So the way that I see it, it's a grand vision on top of what you said that reduces China's vulnerability. Okay, let's get back to Thucydides now. Thucydides said uh, that when Athenians were growing in power to protect themselves from the Persians, they became stronger. And by becoming stronger, they destabilized Sparta. This concept, we call it security dilemma. 
So now what China is doing to protect itself, it creates fears to others. Why? Because this project look uh, <laughs> that it has the capacity that China to unite under its influence Eurasia. And here we come to hardcore geopolitics. It, it, I mentioned control of the sea. How a country like UK that was controlling the sea or American could lose the control of the sea? Only under one condition. If an antagonist controls Eurasia. This is McKinter's logic that in order to protect naval dominance, you have to prevent somebody of controlling Eurasia. And this has become a constant thing in American grand strategy. If there is one constant thing, is how to prevent a challenger at sea, and in order to prevent a challenger at sea, you have to prevent a country occupying Eurasia. And the Americans actually involved in two world wars for that, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, on preventing Germany or Russia to control Eurasia. And now suddenly, it looks slowly like China is trying to control Eurasia. Now, I understand what you said, but if you were sitting in Washington and you could see this thing, you could be nervous. And to make things worse, the red color are the leaders that they attended last month's meeting in, uh, in China. Uh, when your president called the leader of the other countries of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Now, according to the American perspective, if these leaders pay tribute to China, haha, China has already united Eurasia. That's a problem. So that's how the United States sees into that. And on top of it, to make things worse, it's not just public works. It's also digital. Because the Belt and Road, it's not only ports, roads, oh, oh, and uh, pipelines, but it's also a digital Belt and Road Initiative, which is based, uh, the Silk Road has a, a digital aspect. That's why the, the Americans are starting embargo or oh, the, the, your leader in 5G technologies because they feel that China through 5G and it, it, digital belt road creates not just connectivity but an ecosystem that is attached to China because if the 5G is Chinese when you order your book, you don't order it from Amazon, but you order it from the Chinese Amazon. When you pay, you don't pay through Amazon Pay, but through Alibaba Pay. Uh, uh, you understand? And suddenly, uh, uh, it's becoming the Trojan horse that links a kind of economic uh, uh, interaction mostly to China. So the threat uh, that they approach is big, is big. Now, if you are the United States, you have two strategies. Either a rollback to try to stop it by containing it geopolitically and geoeconomically, or an alternative stra strategy, which I think would have been more clever for the Americans, to try to compete with it. And in other words, what can you say to Greece when it has all this economic problem and come the Chinese and they offer investment and you ask them to say no? How can you say don't take an investment that is good for you? 
the only way to compete is to offer a better investment. <laughs> Naturally, instead of complaining what the Chinese are doing, the United States, if it wants to balance this thing, it should come with its own proposals and actually try to beat the Chinese within their own game. Try to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative and having a say. And the Americans doing with Trump, as you suggested, completely the opposite, getting out of all multinational uh, international institutions and leaving it to the Chinese. So the Chinese take the advantage, the Americans complaining, and they do nothing. To, to deal with that is you have to balance it by more investment. That's the natural strategy. But go, falling back and complaining uh, uh, does nothing. And so now we see the first phase that the Americans mostly try to, uh, to roll back uh, some of this project, uh, utilizing some of, uh, uh, let's say, dysfunctionalities of this pro uh, problem. And one dysfunctionality, for example, is the so-called debt trap that was very relevant in, in, in Sri Lanka. But the Chinese are adapting. I think they have learned the, the lesson of Sri Lanka and they negotiate the contracts and make it much more fair when the contracts were not uh, 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 as fair. And by the way, what the Chinese did to Sri Lanka it's 1% of what the Germans did to Greece. Sri the Chinese did to Sri Lanka debt trap in one port. The Germans did to the whole country a debt trap and make Greece pay for 50 years uh, with a debt trap. So the West is complaining of what China is doing to Sri Lanka, but they forgot what the West and mostly Germany has done to Greece. That's a parenthesis on... Uh, uh, on the Canada affair. So, what I have outlined so far is how the Americans and the Chinese view this project. Let me now turn to Europe. Before this Belt and Road Initiative has been built, we already see a huge transformation on trade. The patterns of trade have been shifting. After World War II, the dominant relation was the transatlantic, Europe and the United States. And the whole pillar of stability and the institutions was built on that relationship, Europe and the United States. Look at this map. This relation is becoming already third. It's not the pillar anymore. Which is the most important relation? Europe and Asia. And this before the Belt and Road Initiative. Imagine what's going to happen if the Belt and Road Initiative is being built. This is uh, uh, two years past. It says 1.6 trillion. Now it's already 1.9. So the relation between Europe and America and Europe to Asia is already two to one. With the Belt and Road Initiative, it's going to be three to one, four to one. Which means that Europe is completely schizophrenic. Its economic interest is clearly in Asia, but its geopolitical interest used to be with the United States. But now, not having a Russian threat, uh, the geopolitical becomes less and less important for Europe. And if you really look at Europe, it has not progress on defense, but has only programs on economics. Why? Because the European Union is mostly a geoeconomic unit for competition. The European states even the big ones, Germany, France, they understand that alone cannot compete with China, cannot compete with the US, cannot compete with Japan. So the only way for European countries to compete is sticking together economically. That's precisely what the European Union is doing. And not to stick together 
on the security terms. That's why we don't have European defence, and we are not, never going to have European defence. Especially now that there is no Ra Russian threats, and especially now that the Americans are not looking in Europe, but are looking in the Pacific. So, one prediction that I would like to make is that the conflict between U.S. and, uh, and Europe, because of not only the Belt and Road Initiative, but of the rise of China, will be much more important and will become stronger in the future because uh, Europe will be divided between its economic interest and its ge geopolitical interest. Now, coming now to smaller countries like Greece, Greece cannot change the balance of power. It's too small. And because of its crisis, needs to take care of its geopolitical interest, its economic interest. So, when Chinese came here and have a good, successful exam of win-win, it's a plus for Greece. So, but again, Greece being in the Western Alliance will face the same problem that the other countries are facing. The Americans will ask sooner or later to choose between your economic and geopolitical interest. So that's the problems of, uh, of, of small countries. Uh, I completely agree with you that it's not only uh, economic advantages because of the port, uh, because the port can make Greece a connectivity hub on transportation. And that's what is happening. And if Greece is lucky and become a hub for energy, this will create, uh, increase the geopolitical importance of, um, of Greece. But what you added is also important, that uh, Greece needs to take the advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, and China offers a model and also offers a know-how that is very useful for Greece. So, to try to conclude, because the uh, chairman here is pressuring me, uh, for Greece, definitely has been win-win. Uh, uh, so it's a good case to sell the Belt and Road Initiative because Greece is definitely uh, a win-win project. For Europe, this is going to create a huge dilemma. And uh, I think you're already seeing this dilemma. I mean, uh, countries like Italy uh, started individually dealing with the Chinese. And by the way, that's precisely what the Americans are doing. The Americans don't like to go to the Europeans through Brussels or through NATO. They like bilateral. And I think that's what the Chinese are doing. Uh, so it's naturally for the great powers to, 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 to try to negotiate uh, bilaterally. But in any case, Europe is going to have soon a huge problem on deciding how to, 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 to deal with that. Now, returning to the basic geopolitical conflict in the international system that is going to stay with us in the next 30 years, the rise of China and the, uh, how the U.S. is dealing with that. If I could offer an advice to the Chinese based on my reading of Thucydides, what created the war was not just changing balances of power. It was the aggression of the Athenians behind the balance of power. It, it, it was not just power. It was offensive power. This threatened the Spartans and destabilized them. So you should not read Thucydides only on just pure structural thing, power is rising, war is inevitable. Thucydides make a more nuanced argument that it's not power, it was aggressive and expansionist power that created threat. Because if power was not expansive and aggressive, threat would not have been created. It was the moment that the Athenians started messing around with the Spartan uh, alliance and tried to destabilize the whole Spartan system. So China, in order to avoid this competition 
And by the way, you have already one advantage compared to Athens and Sparta, which is nuclear weapons, and because nuclear weapons make war, war between these two countries not a possibility. It's mutual assured destruction. Therefore, competition takes place at different levels. And at these different levels, it's very important to China not to look aggressive. And it's very important this kind of huge project not to look aggressive to the United States, that it will kind of change the balances of world power and it will overthrow the United States from its position in the international system. So China has to, to strike a very delicate balance uh, between its interest, but also not to destabilize its competitor. Thank you very much. I think we have a good debate going on uh, after uh, having had the um, um, Chinese position on uh, and the logic behind BRI. I think Thanas Platyas summed up, uh, outlined the um, Western perception of, uh, of uh, the BRI. And the logic goes, the Western logic goes that um, um, the Chinese may talk about harmony and a cooperative scheme but uh, huge in infrastructure programs like BRI have important strategic ramifications. And I think that um, he outlined two strategic objectives um, in, uh, in China's conception of BRI. The one is defensive, namely how can China expand, uh, overcome its vulnerabilities vis-à-vis um, -vis a great power that controls many of the choke points around it. And the second being an expansive one, which has to do with control of Eurasia. And I think it's the second one more that Platya said that uh, creates the security dilemma for the West. And then he outlined the approaches of the United States vis-a-vis -vis BRI that have to do with rollback or uh, competition. And then moving to the second component of the Western geopolitical act, which is Europe outlined the, um, um, an ambivalence uh, within Europe that will be with us for the next decades, and that has to do with uh, the conflict between a geopolitical and geoeconomic approach. And uh, um, that, I think, um, distinguishes uh, the approaches of the two parts, of the two components of the Western geopolitical space. And this, I think, is something to watch. Now, with no further ado, last but not least, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Yu Nan will talk to us about China-Europe cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you very much. And I'm being very honored here and, and to deliver the speech. Uh, I would like to express my uh, deep appreciation to all your kind reception and all your thoughtful consideration during our visit here. And, uh, yeah, that's the first page. And as two major uh, forces in the world, in China and Europe, are so and so miles apart, but their relationship is one of the uh, most important bilateral relations in the world. Okay, thanks. And uh, my speech has been uh, separated mm -hmm. into the following parts. The first one is review of China-EU relations and the second achievements in China-EU relations. And third is China-EU relations under BRI and the perception challenges and the pro prospects under the BRI and uh, looking ahead. And uh, so today's, uh, the China and the EU are the critical historical stage of development. How to say that today's world pattern is in a great turbulence and great change and a great uh, readjustment. And China is on the journey to achieve the goal of two con uh, centennial. And the European Union is also in the stage of implementing structural reforms. So uh, it can be said that uh, both China and Europe uh, are jointly respond to the increasing mutual needs of the complex situation of globalization. 
And uh, looking back on the historical development of China-EU relations in the past 50 years, and uh, this has been experienced different stages from constructive partnership to the comprehensive strategic partnership. And the, the main uh, uh, relation to, be, uh, to exp uh, explain the relationship is peace, growth, reform, and civilization. An important um, time points in the development, uh, the first one is in 1975, the China, China established diplomatic relations with the European Economic Community. And then in 1998, China-EU established a constructive partnership. And then in 2013, China and the European Union jointly issued the strategic plan for the China-EU cooperation 2020. And what is the comprehensive strategic partnership between the China and the EU? The comprehensive refers to all around wide ranging and multi level context. And the strategy means that the two sides transcend the differences in history, cultural values, and political systems and strive to build a comprehensive and long term cooperative relationship. The partnership reflects the essence of China EU relations as partners. And the goal uh, of comprehensive strategic partnership is to expand common understanding and win win cooperation and the bottom line is to respect each other's core interests. So the documents between the China and the EU, there are not so many policy documents issued, but there are uh, seven documents issued by Europe to China and three documents issued by China to Europe. Here is the uh, first, uh, the China, uh, EU-China long-term policy. The second, e EU's new strategy for China. And the third one, the comprehensive partnership with China, the EU strategy for China. This is a brief introduction. And the three documents issued by China to Europe is the first document is about uh, 2003, uh, China's policy document on EU. In this document, the Chinese government expressed its desire to cooperate fully with the EU in the political, economic, and the military fields. The second document is uh, on April 2nd, 2014. The third one is uh, in the, uh, 2018. And uh, this paper uh, stresses the joint development of the Belt Road Initiative with the EU Development Plan. And the achievements in China-EU relationship uh, from uh, different point, uh, different um, uh, uh, the political interaction, China-EU relations have been constantly integrated under the leadership of the annual leaders meeting strategy, mainly through three platforms. And the economic cooperation, uh, especially uh, uh, Especially the important export structure tends to be balanced and the trade dependence has changed. The EU has been China's largest training partner for 10 consecutive years. And the cultural exchanges since the establishment of a high level dialogue mechanism between China and Europe, cultural exchanges have been in the, in the ascendant, covering not only the fields of science and technology, education, culture, use, and uh, tourism, but also the characteristics of diversification. And the international and regional affairs, China and Europe have maintained dialogue and coordination, jointly promoted multilateralism and played the central role of the United States in inter international affairs. And uh, in 2019, Xi Jinping's first trip to Europe uh, so why they choose those three countries in Europe for, their, for his first trip this year? Um, it fully demonstrates China attacks great importance to Europe. And Italy and France are both important members of the European Union, and it can provide new impetus for China-EU comprehensive strategic partnership and inject stability into today's international change and bring positive energy to safeguard multilateralism and through docking the BRI construction and the EU-Eurism Euro, Euro, uh, interaction 
interconnection strategy, we will promote the interconnection between the Asian and the European con continents and have the sustainable growth of the global economy. So this is uh, Italy uh, has uh, signed the MOU. And uh, Premier Li Keqiang held the 21st China EU leadership meeting with President Tusk of the European Council and President Juncker of the European Commission. Uh, they have joined a uh, statement of the 21st China EU leadership meeting. And Li Keqiang uh, has put forward to make the open bridge wider and wider, let the bridge of innovation become more and more open, and make a bridge of partners stronger and stronger. And also the Greece uh, 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 has uh, the expansion of the six plus one cooperation mechanism has been transformed into the 17 plus one cooperation. So China EU relations under BRI. So what does the BRI mean? So it is a revival of the ancient Silk Road and consists of railways, highways, and other forms of infrastructure, as well as oil and gas pipelines sector. And there's a two map. We can see the uh, Merrick Time Silk Road and Silk Road. So from this map, we can see that Europe has a very important uh, um, it, it has a very good, important influence to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And there's a two maps of that uh, to uh, see that the witness China overseas environment is in uh, increasing, is in increasing tendency. Mm. And here from this map, you can see the European markets Key BRNY beneficiaries is in the Serbia, Serbia. and uh, more than just the Belt and Road, uh, uh, it is uh, just uh, including uh, transport networks, mining projects, industrial and manufacturing facilities, telecoms, and energy infrastructure, power plants, etc. So many sectors are included. So the key thematic areas of focus on BRI just in five points. Uh, policy coordination, facilities connectivity, trade and investment, financial integration and cultural exchange. And uh, BRI and Central and Eastern Europe. The, uh, the Central and Eastern Europe is a key areas along the way. It is an important size point to the EU market, and uh, it has a compare, uh, contrast advantage, especially compared with the Western Europe. The cost is low and the growth rate is fast. So it, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it has its own advantage. So this is a map about, uh, this is a picture about uh, 6 plus 1, 16 plus 1 meeting. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. It's the, the, the photos uh, in the past years. And the perception, challenges, and the prospects. Uh, actually, this is a research project of my Tsinghua University. Uh, in my, uh, <laughs> I, I have done it with so many colleagues. And so this research, this research will start from cognition BRI in Europe, firstly through literature analysis, a questionnaire survey, and field interviews. And based on this, through the methods of tax analysis and statistical analysis, we can just find the most common way for Europe to build BRI in China and Europe. And finally, with the possibility of changes in the situation of the development of media and short-term international politics, some forward-looking and feasible implementation proposals have been put forward by, for China and Europe to build BRI. And the research questions are the following three main questions is what are the stakes of European countries in the BRI? What do different European countries have different attitudes uh, towards BRI? And why some cases are positive, some are not? How to foster a practical cooperation between China and European countries in the, under BRI? The duration, this is a plan for our um, you know, research project. 
And the journals uh, reviewed, uh, it has just uh, based on the literature from the Chinese scholars. The research on the BRI problem in China tends to focus on some specific pers perspectives and relies on the European perspective. So this is uh, more we should focus on. And the secondary, and the secondary is customary to start from the content of Sino-European cooperation, but neglected the uh, enthusiasm European participation. And third is uh, uh, we should, um, China and uh, Europe are building new problems. So we need to uh, make, uh, we need to study the new materials and to, uh, most of them have an um, optimistic attitude, attitude, but we need to find a uh, negative attitude and to find a reason. Uh, and then, uh, here is a picture just I uh, uh, just put uh, uh, the keywords BRI, perception, challenges, and the prospects in the research um, uh, CNKI in China, and there is a um, map. Uh, photo about uh, that uh, the most uh, uh, scholars, Chinese scholars, uh, focus on the uh, cultural exchanges and uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And the overall trend analysis of our literature research in China. So the main content of the subject is from cognition to practice. The research characteristics is interdisciplinary and transnational cooperation. So my project innovation <coughs> is the three uh, new research subjects, new research perspectives, and new research materials. And perceptions, just from uh, the positive side, uh, there's a uh, there's a researcher has said that the Belt and Road Initiative is a milestone in China's traditional diplomacy based on economic and the commercial calculations to embrace a broader political and security engagement with the countries involved <coughs> by the initiative. And also link Central Europe with Eastern Africa and connect the Pacific and Indian Oceans to the Mediterranean. So I will all also help generate vitality and further promote China's inland provinces to open up, enabling more exchange with other countries and regions. So the BRI effectively embraced the maritime strategy of the EU. Take Greece, for example, which could become China's important gateway for, to Europe and a broker and a cooperation among China. So the negative uh, opinion is the geopolitical implications of the BRI. China has a very high interest in seeing stability in all BRI countries, and may eventually establish a military presence in BRI countries. The negative also includes a uh, could test China's willingness to intervene militarily and abroad, and may internationalize the yuan currency across BRI rules. So attitude changes just uh, uh, have gone three stages. The first stage is to wait and see from the 2013 initiative to the establishment of, establishment of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And second, from the official launch of the AIB to the end of 2016, Trump took office the establishment of the AIB is a key step in the in implementation of the BRI. And the third stage is vigilance and boycott. The reasons for analysis, There's, first there are changes in the international situation and there are cognitive biases. And the second, there's a change in status and there are t uh, double concerns. From the perspective of national interest, the United States concerns about the impact of the BRI include not only the Chinese economy, but also the political influence and the new challenges to the international order. And the third one is to make rule, uh, rules and have a guard mentality. 
And from the perspective of the United States, the U.S. resistance to the BRI is growing stronger. It's believed that after the launch of the BRI, China will borrow RMB from the AIB and Silk Road Fund to expand the scope of the RMB, which will help the internationalization of the RMB and weaken the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. And the Europe, from the Euro perspective of Europe, European countries have less protection and fear than China, and there is a relative large space in Europe for pragmatic cooperation. So what is the difference in the response of the U.S. and European countries? This is related to the changes that are taking place in Europe. European countries are accelerating their decline, and the economies of all European countries are declining compared to China's share of the global economy. So the problems of the China-EU relations under BRI, the first one is there is insufficient political mutual trust and differences in ideas. China and the EU Europe are opposed in political system and ideology. And the second is economy is very of constantly surprising China. So is the China-EU economic and trade relations are asymmetrical. So looking ahead, the first one is deepen to deepen the strategic mutual trust and do a good job of political leadership in order to build a community of human destiny to work <coughs> together to meet, the annual, uh, to meet the challenges. The second one should focus on the new changes in strategic environment of China and Europe to seek new opportunities for cooperation sustainable for each other's development. And the third one, we should serve China-EU problematic cooperation in various fields and promote interconnection between the two sides as soon as possible. Sorry, there are too much. But it's all uh, the paper I have just <coughs> written. It's based on the paper I just written, right? So, good morning. Thank you for your all kind of attention. I have finished. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you very much for this interesting uh, um, and very holistic overview of um, the evolution of uh, European-Chinese relations. And I think we had very, uh, three very complementary presentations today that gave us a lot of food for thought. But uh, we've run terribly out of time. And um, I, would, I would suggest that we have time for one or two questions, and then we'll pause for the uh, next uh, session. Mr. Mazarakis. Um, it's about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the issue of uh, the North Pole, the High North, how it's, uh, because we are talking about a strategy of many years ahead, and this is a trend. The, the, the issue of, uh, of uh, the North uh, Pole being used uh, um, for transportation by sea it puts uh, Russia in the picture again. Um, Canada, perhaps for the first time, uh, providing problems between Canada and the U.S. And uh, also, perhaps, being a danger of finally marginalizing Greece as an entry point uh, due to economically better uh, routes. What... What is your opinion about that from the Chinese side and uh, also from the European? Okay. In, uh, in one or two minutes, if you may. So for the, for the ice seek route, so there are, there are some discussions uh, in China, but there were few contributions to the real you know, uh, policy debate. Because, you know, there's a long-term uh, consideration uh, for the one side. And uh, so for the, you know, for the, uh, for the dominant uh, uh, center of China's econ economics is mostly, you know, through the southeast, you know, southeast uh, 
uh, provinces. So the over the the most uh, uh, important manufacturing capacity should be uh, you know uh, through the Malacca uh, you know track and uh, in India Ocean. So rather than you know north side of uh, ice Silk Road, and uh, more importantly, you know. Russia and uh, Japan, you know, the and particularly uh, South Korea, uh, they want to uh, push this uh, uh, ice Silk Road to be possible uh, because of the they are relying more on you know on Middle East energy. Uh, but this is a too ideal to be a you know economic reality uh, and. Uh, so for some scholars in China, we do not rely on Russia. So the relationship with Russia just uh, uh, determined, be determined by the relationship with the U.S. If the U.S. open uh, Alaska oil and gas to, to China's market, so that is not impossible, uh, not uh, 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 necessary for China to, you know, to use this ice Silk Road. So it's a, your relation with the U.S., is more important, and if we uh, take, uh, try to connect with Europe, you know the you know the the belt and the road is enough. So that's the my understanding. Okay, Thomas. Yes, I completely agree with this analysis. The structure of the trade, let's say Middle East China, or China, United States, or the importing material to the Chinese economy uh, will not going to change. Uh, also, the northern route, it's open for six months, uh, doesn't allow a lot of volume to go through, and it's geopolitically too complicated. So, if I can quantify the impact on uh, Greek shipping, it's not going to be more, uh, more than 2 to 3 percent. So I don't see any fear for the next 30 years until the uh, ice melts completely and we have a different <laughs> world. But uh, from, from what I see, there's not going to be any serious change. I think one last question, and we'll have to leave it at that because it's already 11 o'clock. Vasily. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I know Professor Zhao Kejing from Shandong and uh, Chi Fu, very close to Chi Fu, which is a hometown of Confucius. So I'm wondering from the official line of Chinese, of Marxism with Chinese characteristics and Xi Jinping's thought for the, three, for, the, for the new era, which one of those three elements is stronger in the mindset of the Chinese people? And a question uh, to Professor Platias. So, um, when, when, when we, you talk about structural realism and the rising versus the ruling power, nobody can really make a prediction that next Friday on 2 p.m. the United States will engage in containment. So I'm wondering if you can look ahead in the next two, three years, how soon, I'm not asking you about the quiet moment in time, I'm just asking you about the perspective, how soon do you think that the United States will reach out to their allies and make a direct question, you're either with us or against us? Thank you. It happened already. It's not going to happen. It already happened. And it, 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 it's, you see the Quad Alliance. I mean, containment is here. Look, the United States officially changed its doctrine from engagement to containment. If you read the national security policy uh, of the December 17 and the national defense policy of January um, 2018, it's clear. And you see all the initiatives taking place of setting the military alliance. So containment is already there. Uh, at the same time, you see the trade war happening. And you see technological containment. Uh, now, oh, there is a big debate in the United States, of course, because this strategy is uh, Let's put it this way. It's destabilizing all the economic interests that they were already built in on the engagement strategy. 
so it's the debate is going on in the states, but the State Department, the Department of Defense, are building this thing. And on top of it, if you look how money are being allocated on the defense budget, it's Pacific and it's containing China. So it happened. Okay. Uh, thank you, Valis. Was this is uh, for your. Uh for your asked questions, uh, for Belt and Road Initiative, uh, most uh, scholars uh, pay much more attention to the win-win cooperation. But a win-win cooperation is not enough. So if we want to know that, we should uh, to try to understand the, the inside mind of President Xi. So uh, uh, in his mind of President Xi, he, uh, you know, he trying to uh, trying to make fusion of the Asian thoughts, domestically and the international thoughts, uh, including uh, Asian Greece and uh, and Roma and you know, other uh, other regions. So, uh, according to my understanding, he is a uh, uh, he is a leaders with uh, you know mixed uh, ideas. Uh, just like uh, Plato, you know, to mix the uh, uh, constitution, republic, and uh, in mind of President Xi, he uh, respect the the, uh, the the philosophy and the ideas of Confucius for his, you know, uh, the 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 world for us, you know, to confine ourselves to be a, a benevolent guy and to be a marital. Uh, you know, leader uh, in, in in the world, but he also you know uh, admired the the philosophy and the, and values of Buddhism, and he uh, particularly his mother is a, a very very you know uh, a, a a lady you know who uh, respect the the Buddhism, and uh, so uh, particularly his. Uh, Experience in Zhengding County, he uh, had a lot of discussions and uh, and uh, exchange with uh, the local uh, body, uh, monks uh, of Linji Temple, and uh, he uh, make a quotation from the from the, the Buddhism uh, philosophy, and uh, he also you know respect the the Marxism. Uh, of the you know the dominant view of the Communist Party, so he trying to you know bring them together to uh, formulate a world for all, rather than just a world for us. So for Belt and Road, it's you know, just like a doison, yi yin yi yang, you know one for you know for negative, one for positive, you know to be uh, make a balance. So that is the Prince's framework of the political thinking. Uh, so if we Promote Belt and Road Initiative uh, to be a substantial level. We should know to, to be a heart to heart rather than win win. You know, win win is a fundamental level, you know, the primi primary level. But uh, you know, heart to heart is more significant than win win. So, for example, if Greece has had some troubles, that if China helps Greece. Uh, and China cannot get anything, but China will do because it can be a real friends of Asia uh, of Greece. So and vice versa. So if China has a special considerations and special uh, difficulties, if Greece give enough support, and that will give a you know a more important res response or re rewards from China. This is a you know, in Chinese, Huan Nan Yu Gong. So that's you know, living with a uh, one boat. You know, to to face up the unexpected uh, 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 troubles, we can work together hand in hand and uh, to do uh, something we all enjoy. So okay. that's the the the. the thank thing. you very much. Yeah. Let me thank all the uh, three speakers for uh, three great presentations, and once again the organizers for putting together such an important conference. Thank you all. So we'll move to the second session.
we will have a 10 minute uh, break mm -hmm. please mm -hmm. be in time uh, inside because we are a bit late uh, in the program thank you